Autumn floods. The autumn floods had come. Thousands of wild torrents poured furiously into the Yellow River. It surged and flooded its banks until, looking across, you could not tell an ox from a horse on the other side. Then the river god laughed, delighted to think that all the beauty in the world had fallen into his keeping. So downstream he swung until he came to the ocean. There he looked out over the waves toward the empty horizon in the east and his face fell. Gazing out at the far horizon, he came to his senses and murmured to the ocean god, Well, the proverb is right. He who has got himself a hundred ideas thinks he knows more than anybody else. Such a one am I. Only now do I see what they mean by expanse. The ocean god replied, Can you talk about the sea to a frog in a well? Can you talk about the ice to dragonflies? Can you talk about the way of life to a doctor of philosophy? Of all the waters in the world, the ocean is greatest. All the rivers pour into it day and night. It is never filled. It gives back its water day and night. It is never emptied. It in dry seasons, it is not lowered. In flood time, it does not rise. Greater than all other waters, there is no measure to tell how much greater. But am I proud of it? What am I under heaven? What am I without yang and yin? Compared with the sky, I am a little rock, a scrub oak on the mountainside. Shall I act as if I were something? Of all the beings that exist, and there are millions, man is only one. Among all the millions of men that live on earth, the civilized people that live by farming are only a small proportion. Smaller still the number of those who, having office or fortune, travel by carriage or by boat. And of all these, one man in his carriage is nothing more than the tip of a hair on a horse's flank. Why then all the fuss about great men in great offices? Why all the disputations of scholars? Why all the wrangling of politicians? There are no fixed limits. Time does not stand still. Nothing endures. Nothing is final. You cannot lay hold of the end or the beginning. He who is wise sees near and far as the same, does not despise the small or value the great. Where all standards differ, how can you compare? With one glance he takes in past and present without sorrow for the past or impatience with the present. All is in movement. He has experience of fullness and emptiness. He does not rejoice in success or lament in failure. The game is never over. Birth and death are even. The terms are not final. Great and small. When we look at things in the light of Tao, nothing is best, nothing is worst. Each thing seen in its own light stands out in its own way. It can seem to be better than what is compared with it on its own terms, but seen in terms of the whole, no one thing stands out as better. If you measure differences, what is greater than something else is great. Therefore there is nothing that is not great, what is smaller than something else is small. Therefore there is nothing that is not small. So the whole cosmos is a grain of rice, and the tip of a hair is, a, is as big as a mountain. Such is the relative view. You can break down walls with battering rams, but you cannot stop holes with them. All things have different uses. Fine horses can travel a hundred miles a day, but they cannot catch mice like terriers or weasels. All creatures have gifts of their own. The white horned owl can catch fleas at midnight and distinguish the tip of a hair. But in bright day it stares helpless and cannot even see a mountain. All things have varying capacities. Consequently, he who wants to have right without wrong, order without disorder, does not understand the principles of heaven and earth. He does not know how things hang together. Can a man cling only to heaven and know nothing of earth? They are correlative. To know one is to know the other. To refuse one is to refuse both. Can a man cling to the positive without any negative, in contrast to which it is seen to be positive? If he claims to do so, he is a rogue or a madman. 
thrones pass from dynasty to dynasty. Now in this way, now in that, he who forces his way to power against the grain is called tyrant and usurper. He who moves with the stream of events is called a wise statesman. Kwai, the one-legged dragon, is jealous of the centipede. The centipede is jealous of the snake. The snake is jealous of the wind. The wind is jealous of the eye. The eye is jealous of the mind. Kwai said to the centipede, I manage my one leg with difficulty. How can you manage a hundred? The centipede replied, I do not manage them. They land all over the place, like drops of spit. The centipede said to the snake, with all my feet, I cannot move as fast as you do with no feet at all. How is this done? The snake replied, I have a natural glide that can't be changed. What do I need with feet? The snake spoke to the wind. I ripple my backbone and move along in a bodily way. You without bones, without muscles, without method, blow from the North Sea to the Southern Ocean. How do you get there with nothing? The wind replied, True, I rise up in the North Sea and take myself without obstacle to the Southern Ocean. But every eye that remarks me, every wing that uses me, is superior to me, even though I can uproot the biggest trees or overturn big buildings. The true conqueror is he who is not conquered, by the multitude of the small, the mind is this conqueror, but only the mind of the wise man, the man of Tao, the man in whom Tao acts, without impediment harms no other being by his actions, yet he does not know himself to be kind and to be gentle. The man in whom Tao acts without impediment does not bother with his own interests, and does not despise others who do. He does not struggle to make money, and does not make a virtue of poverty. He goes his way without relying on others, and does not pride himself on walking alone. While he does not follow the crowd, he won't complain of those who do. Rank and reward make no appeal to him. Disgrace and shame do not deter him. He is not always looking for right and wrong, always deciding yes or no. The ancients said therefore. The man of Tao remains unknown. Perfect virtue produces nothing. No self is true self. The greatest man is nobody. The turtle. Shuangsa, with his bamboo pole, was fishing in Pu River. The prince of Chu sent two vice-chancellors with a formal document. We hereby appoint you prime minister. Shuangsa held his bamboo pole, still watching Pu River. He said, I am told there is a sacred tortoise. Offered and canonized three thousand years ago, venerated by the prince wrapped in silk in a precious shrine on an altar in the temple. What do you think? Is it better to give up one's life and leave a sacred shell as an object of cult in a cloud of incense three thousand years? Or better to live as a plain turtle dragging its tail in the mud? For the turtle, said the vice-chancellor, better to live and drag its tail in the mud. Go home, said Shuangzi, leave me here to drag my tail in the mud. Owl and Phoenix, Huai Tzu, was prime minister of Liang. He had what he believed to be inside information that Shuangzi coveted his post and was intriguing to supplant him. In fact, when Shuangzi came to visit Liang, the prime minister sent out the police to apprehend him. The police searched for him three days and three nights, but meanwhile, Shuang presented himself before Huai Tzu of his own accord and said, Have you heard about the bird that lives in the south, the phoenix that never grows old? This undying phoenix rises out of the south sea and flies to the sea of the north, never alighting, except on certain sacred trees. He will touch no food but the most exquisite rare fruit, drinks only from clearest springs. Once an owl, chewing a dead rat, already half decayed, saw the phoenix fly over, looked up and screeched with alarm, clutching the rat to himself in fear and dismay. Why so frantic, clinging to your ministry and screeching at me in dismay? The joy of fishes. Shuangzi and Huai Tzu were crossing Hao River by the dam. Shuang said, See how free the fishes leap and dart. It is their happiness. Huai replied, Since you are not a fish, how do you know what makes fishes happy? 
Shuang said, since you are not I, how can you possibly know that I do not know? What makes fishes happy? Huai argued, if I, not being you, cannot know what you know, it follows that you, not being a fish, cannot know what they know. Shuang said, wait a minute, let us get to back to the original question. What you asked me was, how do you know? What makes fishes happy? From the terms of your question, you evidently know I know what makes fishes happy. I know the joy of fishes in the river through my own joy as I go walking along the same river. Perfect joy. Is there to be found on earth a fullness of joy, or is there no such thing? Is there some way to make life fully worth living, or is this impossible? If there is such a way, how do you go about finding it? What should you try to do? What should you seek to avoid? What should be the goal in which your activity comes to rest? What should you accept? What should you refuse to accept? What should you love? What should you hate? What the world values is money, reputation, long life, achievement. What it counts as joy is health and comfort of body, good food, fine cloths beautiful things to look at, pleasant music to listen to. What it condemns is lack of money, a low social rank, a reputation for being no good, and an early death. What it considers misfortune is bodily discomfort and labor, no chance to get your fill of good food, not having a clothes to wear, having no way to amuse or delight the eye, no pleasant music to listen to. If people find that they are deprived of these things, they go into a panic or fall into despair. They are so concerned for their life that their anxiety makes life unbearable, even when they have the things they think they want. The very concern for enjoyment makes them unhappy. The rich make life intolerable, driving themselves in order to get more and more money which they cannot really use. In so doing, they are alienated from themselves and exhaust themselves in their own service as though they were slaves of others. The ambitious run day and night in pursuit of honors, constantly in anguish about the success of their plans, dreading the miscalculation that may wreak everything, wreck everything. Thus they are alienated from themselves, exhausting the real life in service of the shadow created by their insatiable hope. The birth of a man is the birth of his sorrow. The longer he lives, the more stupid he becomes, because his anxiety to avoid unavoidable death becomes more and more acute. What bitterness! He lives for what is always out of reach. His thirst for survival in the future makes him incapable of living in the present. What about the self-sacrificing officials and scholars? They are honored by the world because they are good, upright, self-sacrificing men, yet their good character does not preserve them from unhappiness, nor even from ruin, disgrace, and death. I wonder, in that case, if their goodness is really so good after all. It is perhaps a source of unhappiness. Suppose you admit they are happy, but is it a happy thing to have a character and a career that led to one's own eventual destruction? On the other hand, can you call them happy, unhappy if in sacrificing themselves they save the lives and fortunes of others? Take the case of the minister who conscientiously and uprightly opposes an unjust decision of his king. Some say tell the truth, and if the king will not listen, let him do what he likes. You have no further obligation. On the other hand, Zhu Xu continued to resist the unjust policy of his sovereign. He was consequently destroyed. But if he had not stood up for what he believed to be right, his name would not be held in honor. So there is the question, shall the course he took be called good, if at the same time it was fatal to him? I cannot tell if what the world considers happiness is happiness or not. All I know is that when I consider the way they go about attaining it, I see them carried away headlong, grim and obsessed in the general onrush of the human herd, unable to stop themselves or to change their direction, all the while they claim to be just on the point of attaining happiness. For my part, I cannot accept their standards, whether of happiness or unhappiness. I ask myself if, after all, the concept of happiness has any meaning whatever. 
My opinion is that you never find happiness until you stop looking for it. My greatest happiness consists precisely in doing nothing whatever that is calculated to obtain happiness, and this is in the minds of the most of most people is the worst possible course. I will hold to the saying that perfect joy is to be without joy, perfect praise is to be without praise. If you ask what ought to be done and what ought not to be done on earth in order to produce happiness, I answer that these questions do not have an answer. There is no way of determining such things. Yet at the same time, if I cease striving for happiness, the right and the wrong at once become apparent all by themselves. Contentment and well-being at once become possible the moment you cease to act with them in view. And if you practice non-doing, well, why? You will have both happiness and well-being. Here is how I sum it up: Heaven does nothing; its non-doing is its serenity. Earth does nothing; its non-doing is its rest. From the union of these two non-doings, all actions proceed. All things are made. How vast! How invisible! This coming to be. All things come from nowhere. How vast! How invisible! No way to explain it. All beings, in their perfection, are born of non-doing. Hence, it is said, "Heaven and earth do nothing; yet there is nothing they do not do." Where is the man who can attain to this non-doing? All right, we're going to end it there on page one hundred two. Next chapter is Symphony for a Seabird. This is the Way of Schwangza by Thomas Merton. Thanks for visiting philosophyvideo.com. Subscribe to us on YouTube at philosophyvideos.com. Like us on Twitter. Share this video. Like our Facebook page, and、uh, please comment if you enjoyed this reading from *The Way of Schwangza* by Thomas Merton. Again, this is philosophyvideos.com.